was just really into looking for the cartoons throughout the paper, and that just made me a real big newspaper fan. To this day, you know, I drive my family crazy by bringing newspapers home all the time and just like, just go through all of them because it's just something I grew up on. Right, and, and so what, what were some of the strips that, that, that you liked? That I liked, I mean, you know, back in the day, it was, I mean, just Peanuts was it. Peanuts, Peanuts was it, yeah, Peanuts. Did, did you read any comic books back in the I mean, I really didn't, I mean, I read comic collections of, of Charlie Brown, <laughs> but I also remember going to my library and they only had two cartoon books, which were Charlie Brown and Doonesbury. And what, what fascinated me about Doonesbury is clearly they were mixing in stuff that was going on yeah, yeah. and present day. And I think that's where I got the idea of mixing in true life stuff with imaginary stuff. And so, um, and, and Doonesbury really was the first cartoon that showed me black characters that were black characters. They weren't just a, a character that seemed just like everybody else, except they were black. There was, I remember one early Doonesbury book where um, one of the black characters knocked on Doonesbury's door and said, hey, can you um, give to the local Black Panther, campus Black Panther party? And they're like, no, man, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, pretty empty today. And then other guys are like, no, I can't do it. So then <laughs> the kid writes a little X on Doonesbury's door <laughs> and walks off and they're like, I don't know, this doesn't look too good. But I, I just thought that was really funny. And All right, it was the, the subtlety in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but just that, I remember that really stuck out in my head. But I remember reading, obviously, Mad Magazine. Mad right, Magazine, Magazine was a huge yeah. um, influence on me. And then, um, but back in the day, you know, it was Bloom County, uh, it was huge. Well, this is what I loved, was leaving my house and going to my Uncle Owen's house, and he had the Boston Herald. And in there, there was all these other cartoons that were not in the globe. So that's where I saw Maury Turner Weaver. I was gonna ask about Weaver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then, I forget this one. It was, I think the lead, it was called Moose or something. It was just a family that lived in squalor. There was like trash all over the place. Like, I, I, there's a Moose Miller. It was just like trash everywhere, garbage and, and, ah. and like fish bones and everything. And I was just really fascinated by that. But also my uncle Owen was very, he was an artist and um, he used to sh point to me, there was one panel where it was a couple that were always fighting all the time. Um, and the way it was drawn is their heads would always float just above their bodies. Like they weren't connected, and he would always point that out. Like, see how that head just floats. And so those little things, and learning the language, because the first language I think we all learn is the language of cartooning. Who teaches you how to read a comic strip? No one does, right? We just like sort of learn that it's left to right, and that you know this is a word balloon, and then this one with the circles is a thought bubble, and you know. If there's new lines, that means they're shaking. Like, if you learn it, it right. I think it's like the first language we all learn. And so it's really uh, a neat thing to sort of continually pick up. That's how you pick up the skills. Is yeah, you, sure. If you see something you've never seen before, I'm like, wow, I like the way they do that. And you incorporate it. And that's how, I, I, to this day, I see cartoons and go, I want to do it like that. I want to do it like that. You know, I still learn what to do and what not to do with cartoons. But, you know, really, the newspaper cartoons, Jules Pfeiffer on Sundays, seeing Pfeiffer stuff, the fact that he didn't use panels, I love that, I love that. Um, Ch uh, Chuck Jones, Warner Brothers cartoons, that's a huge influence. Um, Daffy Duck? Yeah, Daffy Duck, or Bugs Bunny, or both? I am a Daffy Duck person, <laughs> because Daffy Duck can play both uh, the protagonist, he can play the good guy and the bad guy, mm -hmm. like he's very versatile. Although, I really like it the few times, and I don't like early Bugs Bunny, I'm trying to explain it by uh, my son. <laughs> uh, uh, early Bugs Bunny too, because um, early Bugs Bunny was very irritating and you wanted right. to, him to get you know caught or blasted, but it's the later 
cross-dressing Bugs Bunny. You want to be the cool cross-dressing Bugs Bunny. And the role of those, he was put upon. You know, when, when, when you watch those Bugs Bunny cartoons, he wasn't the one making the first move. Someone else came along and annoyed him. That's true, that's true. But there are a couple where he's a little slightly, the Robert McKinson ones, where one time um, they were posting up uh, the bounties for different animals, and, and I think Rabbits got two cents, and he got really mad, and he came to Washington, and went to the, 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 the game warden or something, and said, how come bunnies are only two cents? And he says, oh, they're, they're harmless bunnies, and he's like, I'll show you. And then he goes, and he, he saws off uh, Florida, and lets him fool it out. So he, that's, you know, that's the bugs bunny you want to be. <laughs> but um, yeah, just you know, just running. Uh, I, 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 but I love that. And I'll tell you this: those folks who grew up in the Warner Brothers cartoons have a literacy that generations after don't have. And I would say the only thing that equates it. And here's here's why: because Chuck Jones would take you know, like. A wagon hope it's the opera, and then yes. put you know, what's on the web, and kill the web, and, and you, you, you're you learning something, but you don't realize you're learning something, and that's what I loved about those cartoons. And it's the same thing, I will say this hip hop does the same thing. The golden age of hip hop, if you listen to all the samples, all the different samples that the music they turn you on to, and the turn of phrases is very similar. So, I am so lucky to have come up when Warner Brothers cartoons were big and hip hop was big because that is what really fuels the the idea of all the stuff that I put into my comics. You may not get all the references, but like later on you might be like, oh wow, that's what he was talking about. That's what I love yeah. about any any piece of art is when you're figuring out, oh that's what that means. That's what right. you know getting that stuff. And um, I just want to say how proud I am of my son Julian, who made this little print of Rosa Louise Parks. I didn't know Rosa Parks' middle name was Louis, uh, Louis, I'm sorry, Louis. Is, is this true, Julian? Is this Rosa Parks' middle name? <laughs> <laughs> racism and Warner Brothers cartoons. <laughs> but the bigger thing is like, you know, is, is hip hop and just all the different influences of, of just the media and, you know, what I grew up on, I try to channel into my work. <clears throat> and, and so when did you start putting pen or pencil or crayon to paper? And I think we all do when we're little kids and we're always encouraged until you get to school. And then I was always continually encouraged, but I think when someone starts saying, oh, look at this, and, and they're not doing it to yours, you get a little discouraged because they're always putting up somebody else's stuff. But I was always encouraged to do it until I got into uh, the upper grades. And then I, my art teachers were trying to discourage me from doing it, which is really weird, but they said, you should get into like medical stuff. They didn't take comics seriously at all. And back then they didn't. A lot of them still don't. Yeah. Okay, so. And people, the people that did encourage me were my English professors. <laughs> they were the ones who encouraged me to do it. And I had a great high school teacher who allowed me, instead of doing a regular book report, we read the book Animal Farm, and I did um, a comic book report on Animal Farm. He allowed me to do a comic book report. So I did a comic book par parody of Animal Farm. So I don't know if you're familiar with Animal Farm, but George Orwell, farm animals take over a farm, kick out all the, the humans, they have four legs, they make up laws. Uh, four legs are good, two legs are bad. So I had my, me and my friends take over the high school and kick out all the, the adults. <laughs> and we said, under 18 good, over 18 bad. And I did parodies of all, like uh, caricatures of like high school teachers. And also making fun of all these kids and, in class, and my teacher was so excited that he 
he kept it uh, in the teacher's lounge <laughs> to show the teachers. And uh, and I thought I was gonna, I thought everyone was gonna get me, but everyone was just happy that they were in it. Yeah. Even if you were in it, which is, you know, I was like, wow, like if I could do this for a living, make fun of people for a living, and not get beat up, like that was like that was gonna be my thing. And, and he wrote eight plus plus. He captured the essence of animal farm perfectly. But more importantly, you should be doing a syndicated comic strip. So that was the first time I heard syndicated comic strip. And so it got me like looking into syndicates and all that type of stuff. But the other big change I had was uh, with a teacher. Was, it wasn't until I was a junior in college. And then when well, I was where did you go to college and what was your major in college? Salem State College and now it's university. No, don't you have some kind of special address that you're doing now? Tell everybody about that. I just got invited by Salem State University to the, do their 2020 commencement in May. So I'm returning. Every time I say it, I go like this. I don't know what I'm going to say, but it's going to be like this. I told you all. No, I, I, I don't know. No, but um, but I, I was a graphic design. There were no cartoon classes. And like, it was just a regular state school. And um, but it would have been in the 80s. <laughs> Today, he's here. And he graduated two award winning syndicated cartoonists. Mark Parisi uh, of Off the Mark is from there, too. So people go there thinking that there's some fancy cartoon program right there. <laughs> this is nothing in there. So they always give them my number, and then people say, like, what did, what did you take? But um, I took graphic design because that's all, that's all. And my parents started worrying at this time. That I was serious about <laughs> cartoons. I was going to ask you your parents' response to all of this. So they started going, Ooh, you know, there's no money in cartooning. And uh, they were right. They were right. But it was too late by this time. So uh, I was going hardcore. And um, so I did it for my local newspaper. And, uh, I mean, the school, the campus newspaper. Oh, so you, know you worked on the campus newspaper? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, I did posters for local bands and events and stuff like that. But I had a teacher, I had my first black teacher in college. And there was a study that came out like t last year or two years ago that um, black students have, have a 30 to 30, their, their chance of going to college goes up 30 to 35% when they have one black teacher in the first 12 years of school. The first 12 years of school. And so I can't tell you how important it was to have this black teacher because he was an American literature teacher. Uh, American literature teacher, and he assigned us Richard Wright, um, James Baldwin, Maya Angelou, um, who else? Um, uh, Ralph, Ralph Ellison. Ellison, yeah. And when someone said, like, why are you giving us all black writers? He said, I'm giving you all American writers. <laughs> and so when I heard that, <laughs> my head exploded. Right, sure. It's, when we learn American writers, you think of Mark Twain. Yeah. And he was just, he was basically using, he was working within the system to subvert the system. And so I thought that was just amazing. And like, it was just, I loved that class. And uh, he gave me an A minus, even though I deserved an A. But he, <laughs> but he was a great teacher. And he uh, really sparked, it made me say, okay, when I do this cartoon, I'm going to do it from the perspective of a black male. And some of the stuff that, you know, everyone's going to get, some of the stuff only a few people are going to get, but like, it's going to be distinctly from that perspective. And, and so, once you left college, was that the point that you went down to San Francisco, or was there a delay? And then once you got to San Francisco, what did you do to further your comics income? Well, there was no delay. It was, I, I worked in Fenwell Hall in, in Boston, uh, drawing caricatures, and it was like a great, it was a great job because you sat, you know, you just drew comics, but you also heard everybody's accent, and so you're like, oh my god, the Boston accent is the worst. <laughs> so that's why, you know, if I have a few beers and the socks are on, then it comes back. But, um, but you know, I got rid of the bed, but. We had one artist, Dale Stefanos, who's this amazing illustrator, and he would get all the good jobs. So those jobs would have him travel around the country. And he went to San Francisco, and then when he came back, he was like, he's like, you gotta check out San Francisco. He said, 
it's like, he just wrapped up like a big, it's like Harvard Square, but it's the whole city. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I'm going. And so I worked really hard, I saved up money for the, uh, the summer, and then just jumped in a car and drove out there. And I thought I was gonna be there for five years, I stayed there for 16. Uh, I met my lovely wife, um, and we, um, basically, that is really the birthplace of sort of underground cartooning in the States. You know? Right, that's where, that's where Robert Crowe yeah. started, you know, selling Zap out of a yeah. baby carriage yeah. story. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and so literally, I would be there doing my zines, and I would, um, was that, um, uh, the mini comics? Yeah, the mini comics, you'd go to... FedEx, that, well, back in the day, was called Kinko's. And it's funny, because we were just talking about this today, is I used to go there, and there used to be like, you know, these crazy, like, 50-year-old guys, like, running off their manifestos, and like, they were living together. And then, you know, I realized today, I am that guy. I'm <laughs> guy that someone looks at, and so it's like, what's that guy? Yeah. So, you know, I'm that guy. Um, so, I used to, Put the zines together, and there were a lot of good places to, to sell them. And I, but I used to wear a sandwich board. I used to wear a sandwich board and sell them at Goldgate Park. I would sell them at the San Francisco Book Fair. I remember going with my cousin to New York and being on the subway with the sandwich board. <laughs> and people that people either thought we were undercover police officers or just I don't know what they thought, but we had a, I had a, I, I would have a really fun, fun time. And you did like what, like ten of those? Ten I think I did ten of, yeah, I think ten of, uh, ten of those, but I mean, seriously, like just doing zines, I ended up, um, there was a German filmmaker, um, I have all these different connections to Germany, and I'm not just married to a German, but this German filmmaker wrote to me and said, hey, can I develop your cartoon into a, um, a short film. I said, yeah, sure, just spell my name right in the credits. I, you know, I didn't think it was a real thing. But he did this, he created this short film called Yes, Pump Time. Uh, yes, Pump Time, Cartoon. And it, it won some award and some Lunin Fest, and it was supposed to show at the Castro for the Berlin and Beyond Film Festival, but there was some something that prevented it from showing there. But um, I'm going to try to get the rights to it to put it on a TV in the TV show, so um, yeah. there are all these Easter eggs in the show that, uh, uh, that are going to be in, that people who know me from my childhood are going to be like, oh my god, I can't believe he did that. You know? Well, before we get to the TV show, so, so you're doing the scenes. Yeah. And, um, how did you get into the old weekly world? The all week, yeah. So I remember I ran like in local color. They, they, the very first script that was ever run in the local newspaper was I, I was a review of a Beastie Boys show <coughs> that I did. And um, it was the Beastie Boys, and then they had two unknown bands opening for them. And one was, um, I forget what the first one, but the other one was a very unknown band called Cypress Hill. <laughs> and, uh, this was just when they were starting. And, um, and I remember someone trying to break into the club by climbing through the window of the bathroom. And I, you know, I'd write, written about that. Like, and I'd ripped on the bouncers, made fun of them and everything, and people loved it. People went nuts. And so then I got an inquiry from the SF Weekly about it. But then they, something happened where they weren't in contact with me for a long time. And then the guy who called me became the editor. And here's what I did is I taped a $10 bill to a letter with my cartoons in it, and I sent it to him, and I said, don't spend it all in one place. <laughs> and I got in the next week. So, <laughs> I'm telling you, like, bribery does work. <laughs> I'm in Washington, so I don't know what to say. <laughs> no, no, you see, it's very interesting we're saying because a lot of folks and other people got in the old weekly world, and unlike going through a syndicate, you actually had to do all the hustling yourself. You had to contact the papers, and. So t tell us about that process. Yeah, well, uh, th this is why, like, this is our moment. As as the republic crumbles, it's it's the it's the ones that have always struggled. Their whole when you're an, an indie cartoonist and you, 
you're everything. You're the accountant, you're the business person, you're the creator, you're the, the press person, you're, you do all the hype stuff to, um, you, you do everything. So you're completely prepared for it. So yeah, we have to send out portfolios to everybody and then follow up and then like, you have to invoice people, which my family knows I'm very slow at that. And, uh, and just um, you do all that hustle stuff. So when newspapers started to crumble, I went to a, an editorial cartoonist convention hoping to like glean some knowledge from all these elder statesmen. And they were coming to me <laughs> because they were like, hey, I've been working at this place for 30 years. They just, they just let me go. I don't know how to do Photoshop. I don't know how to do, like, how do you do what you do? And so I was just like, oh my God. If they're coming to me, then we're due to garage. <laughs> so it's just really surprising. So at all, everybody who has, who struggled in the, in the alt-weekly market are somehow making it work now because they figured it out, you know, right. somehow, some way. And it's ways like through Patreon, which is this great subscription service for people. If you want to subscribe to my work, you can go through that. Or they'll do, you know, I do college slide shows, I go on the road and do that. Um, they get TV shows or, you know, some awesome way. Um, no, but, it, but th there's all these different ways that people have somehow been able to make it work and continue to create what they create. And so I was very, very fortunate. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say quickly. I grew my, um, subs you know, the, the alternative weekly market. Then it started to collapse and crumble. Craigslist came in and Craigslist, yeah, oh, yeah. And it's all the guy who started Craigslist. I used to see at the office uh, depot where I used to make copies, and we used to see each other all the time. So I, if I took them out right there, then none of this would happen. I don't encourage that. So now, now, how did Think come come to be in K Chronicles and the differences between those two? So the K Chronicles was the autobiographical strip that I started. I first did an autobiographical strip when I was in junior high about a food fight, and, I, and no one got it right, the story right, so I decided to set the record straight and do this comic strip. And that was the very first one, and it developed into a regular strip and that was a daily size back in the day. And then when I got to San Francisco and saw alternative comics and how big they were, I made it the size of Matt Groening's Life and Health. Oh, so right. that's how I got the nine panel size. So I was, I was doing that, doing well, and then I was approached by Africana.com to um, do another, a strip for them. They wanted an autobiographical strip, and I was like, I'm not gonna do the same thing. So I said, I want to take a, uh, a, instead of autobiographical, I want to take it from the news. Instead of a multi-panel, I want to do it as a single panel. And so I went in there. I remember drawing my first ink strip on a, a bar napkin. And it was uh, Denny's. It was a Denny's strip, a Denny's sign that says, serving blacks since 1997. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I got the gig. Um, <laughs> It's just funny. I still have that little bar napkin, so you know, if you'd like to buy it, you can. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it was what I didn't realize is if you take think, um, I do think is night spelled backwards without the G, and I didn't realize that until 15 years later. I was just staring at it. I was like, wow, like it's just such a weird thing because I just never. I never realized that until you stare at a blank page. Right, right. right. But, um, but um, so they came about um, in about 1999, and that just took off. And and um, yeah, because I remember you coming to SPX first time. I've got one book from SPX 1998. When did you start going to these alternative comics festivals and things? Like that? Oh, I, I, I've, I've always gone. Yeah, you know, I went to I first went to Comic Con in San Diego in '93. But, you know, whenever there were new alt uh, comic cons Ape, and things like that, yeah. Stuff, yeah, I was always going from the beginning. And, um, yeah, it's just, I am a people person. I am, being a cartoonist is probably the worst thing for me because I, I don't like sitting by myself, but I do cave and drawing things. You know, I... You go out to a coffee 
coffee shop. I go to a coffee shop, I will go to, I will sit in a lobby, I will sit, any, any sort of stimulation that like, I just can't sit, like I need something going on. So um, to others, like it's probably like, how can you do this? But I saw this article once that said like, even a little bit of caffeine noise is actually better for your mind to concentrate. And and so what um, to get technical for it, okay? So you're still ink on paper, and so you know what kind of paper do you like? What kind of pen nibs for all the pen nib geeks out there? And yeah, um, I mean, Jasper, can you grab my equipment out of the bag there? You can. So I do. I use micron pigments um, markers, but I think I actually found an alternative. Because my products, I think their quality has fallen off a little bit. And, um, and, and this happens. I've heard other creators who talk about um, how supplies they use, whether it's ink or nibs, what have you, just has fallen off the quality. Yeah, yeah. So this, you know, you see these micron pigments all, all over the place, but in places like Michael's and stuff like that. So I've just found these Prisma colors that are similar, and uh, these are far more inky and they're far, uh, I think, higher quality, at least for now. But also, I used to do these rub-a-dub laundry markers that were are made by sh uh, Sharpie, but they're white instead of this gray, but they don't make them anymore. They, I don't know what happened, but we used to use them all the time for our caricature, so that's how I got used to them. So now I use Sharpies, which I don't really want to use, but, uh, but I don't know, it's just like, what can I say? And, and you do pencils first, then you ink, and then you scan in. Yeah, I mean, like, Jasper, you want to grab a, the, one of my pads? I think there's a pad in there. Um, so, yeah, I still do it on, um, yeah, there it is. This is a Bristol, um, you know, I still use Stratmore Bristol. And let's see what's in here right now. Ooh, look, there's one of the latest Cape Chronicles. So this is the size I do it, and I don't do the Cape Chronicles anymore in nine panels. Um, just because the sharpies are so thick, and I'm trying to do it on this smaller pa paper. I'm trying to save trees, uh, honestly. I'm trying to save trees. But this is the size I do it in, and then it fits, fits on my scanner, and I uh, get that down. Um, think, obviously, is smaller, so it's a little easier. I do have some artwork here from the show, but I can't show you it, because then it will give away part of the, part of the stuff. Well, and actually, that, that's a bit needed. So, you, you did Nightlife, and that got syndicated. You oh. the Washington Post. Okay, so so why did I do the Nightlife? This is probably what most people are familiar, <coughs> familiar with. Sorry. For years and years, syndicates have, have bugged me to do a daily strip. And I would say, nah, I'm in a band. Uh, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making no money in a band, so why would I make no money doing a daily strip? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so finally, um, the, we saw the writing on the wall. We were in San Francisco, and I was like, like I didn't want to be. You saw that San Francisco was changing, and it's a really different place. Oh, it totally is, and I didn't want to be stuck. We were in a break rent control apartment. We had like a three bedroom, and it was like fifteen hundred, I think, what it was. We were sitting pretty, but I didn't want to be stuck there, and I didn't want to be like. Bitter San Francisco, man, this used to be cool back in the day, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So we took off for LA, much to everyone's, right? <laughs> you know, it's grand, like everyone was horrified. Cover City, yeah, oh, City. Cover City. And we got down there, and, and we, didn't, we didn't have a car, did we? You had your stick shift, right? But I, I can't drive a strict stick shift, so I didn't have a car for three years now. Which is, you, you can't do it. You can't do it. I, I, you can actually do it now better because there's a subway there now. But, um, but we were down there because I wanted to try to develop something for television. And we had Jasper. Uh, and I realized, like, I have to make some money, so I have to go for it. So, so we, I launched a daily strip in the worst year of, in newspaper history, which is 2008. That's when the bottom fell out. And like, I thought I was in all these papers and then I was not in any of these papers. And it was, um, 
so 11 years I had nine deadlines um, and it was, you know, it was great working in the format of it, the challenge of it, like trying to work in this small space and I loved sort of creating the new characters for it, doing all, like I love the daily format, but it is a grind that, you know, back in the day you could get into automatically <coughs> papers almost. Right, and the other paper, I'd say that these days, the syndicates don't give you the support that they used to give. They can't afford it because there aren't that many newspapers, and so they can't afford all these salespeople going all over the place. And literally, part of the deal is newspapers are so old fashioned that they literally, like, there were papers that wouldn't run the strip because there was a, a, a mixed race couple in the strip, right? right. There is similar to the 21st century. Yeah, the yeah. internet. So, like, it's, you know, it's hardly newspapers' fault that newspapers are, are, because there's something that newspapers do that the internet can't do, which is, I think, with the internet, you're, you know, you get distracted by stuff and you follow, you know, you follow the little shaking bikini in the corner. But, with the newspaper, you look at everything. So when you turn a page, you have an opportunity to really do something really neat with like the layout and design. But also, people read all the whole like they look at everything in there. And I just think that that you could design a paper. And McSweeney's did a, a version of what they thought would be a good newspaper, um, and, and it was full of comics and color and all this different stuff. And, that's the way newspapers should try to move forward. But, right. you know, with the way our laws are, you just basically have these corporations buying these papers and not really caring about them, firing everybody and just putting the same content everywhere. So it's a, it's a lost cause. I think comics are one of the few things that are inexpensive that you can put in there that are unique that will make people, bring people the paper. And, and that used to be not only the reason of the Comic strips way back in the day when they had the comic strip wars, but also the old weekly papers, they brought in the comics and they would put them in the classified sections. Yeah, yeah. to be sure that people want their classifieds to go ahead and read yeah. them. So. And, yeah, and that's the first thing that they cut on the cartoons. And, like, literally, they still pay $25 per week, like, cartoons in a paper. It's, they pay the same as they paid two decades ago, if you're lucky. So it's, it's insane. It's insane. Being a cartoonist today, I mean, thank goodness for the internet. Like, like that's the way to go. Because all you need to do is cultivate your group of people, and uh, and they will support you if they like your work. They will support them. So we're we're sort of running short of time. So here's a question: Do you want to do some of the presentation, or do you want to take some questions? Oh, well, why don't we take questions and the presentation at the same time? And speaking of support, boys, <laughs> this is your time. <laughs> they wouldn't allow me to sell any books or prints or anything in there unless I went through the, it was a nightmare trying to set it up. So um, I'm going to have my sons pass out these cards to you. So if you guys are interested in my books or my prints or bringing me to your school to, I do this slideshow on uh, racial illiteracy, um, and, which I think is the country's biggest problem. And it uses humor and storytelling, but it's a very serious uh, thing. But I, I do it all over the place. I just did VCU and Richmond. And, and, and you've been doing this for a while in terms of uh, having this, uh, your slideshow, going to college and universities and talking about race. What, what are some of the experiences you've had there? Oh, it, it's been amazing. Again, I am a person who likes to go up and sit and talk with people and, and present and stuff. And so, I figured if no one under 50 is going to read my comics in the paper, I'm going to bring it to them in person. So, uh, so I've been doing all these colleges all over the country, and uh, and I've done them overseas too. I've done a bunch of colleges in Germany and um, and and Saint, in Saint, I can't remember where it was, but anyway, um, it's been amazing. And people, I mean, similar stories all over the place. There's just we continue to do some of the things you know are heartbreaking where you know kids are going to school for the first time and they're just telling me their experiences about you know like really their experiences 
with racism for the first time, you know, you know, people in blackface and you know doing all this bizarre stuff, and and um, yeah, I remember there were these two old, older women sitting in the middle of a one I did in Chicago, and they came up to me and said, you know, when we were students in the seventies, we sat in those same seats and listened to the exact same presentation, you know, like you know, fifty years later or forty years later, because we learned nothing about, you know, when people say, oh, Black History Month, we learn nothing about black history in this country. Nothing. We learn the same four or five feel-good stories, and the majority of the history of, of black people in this country is a, a harsh, horrible history of a nation that has been built on the backs of enslaved people. And what I do in my slideshow is really explain to people, what could you build if you had 250 years of free labor? What sort of business could you build? What sort of nation could you build? And the fact that we take the time, we take about a paragraph in a history book and, and, and talk about it is absurd. We know that the, the, the generation, the descendants of people that were in the Holocaust, survivors of the Holocaust, have higher degrees of depression and of suicide because they carry that trauma genetically. So what do you think is carried within the descendants of people who were enslaved for 250 years and then 100 years of Jim Crow? And, and how could you possibly imagine that 50 years of affirmative action you know, eight years of a black president is gonna wipe out 300, 400 years of oppression. Like, we know that when you break something, it's a lot quicker to break something than it is to fix something. And we don't, I use my comics and my storytelling and my statistics, statistics and facts to explain that if we just examine the history, everything that's going on right now with who's in the White House right now, with what's going on with voter suppression right now, police brutality, the disparity between wealth and white families and black families, all that would be explained if we just examined the history. And, and you know, down in Texas, you know, they have the school books that they have down there. I mean, they, they, they go ahead and they, they give it about that much. You know, different states have different ways of doing that, but even the high school yearbooks, in some states, are pur they purposely downgraded. Oh, oh, okay. believe me, after moving to the South and hearing sort of the stories. No, listen, no, I, I'm gonna defend that. I've learned more about the black experience moving to the South than five years than I've ever learned to live growing up in Massachusetts or in California. Because what happens is, and this happens all over the country, we are fed what I call pop music history. Christopher Columbus, it's pop music history, okay? Jackie Robinson being the first black to play professional baseball, like in mainstream baseball, is pop music history. Blacks and whites played in the 1800s, you know? That is a result, they, and whites kicked blacks out of baseball up until Jackie Robinson got back in. But uh, Christopher Columbus, in his own words, does not deserve a holiday named after him. Do you read the first 10 pages of Howard's and his People's History of the United States, which gives you the US history from the perspective of enslaved people, indigenous people, Mexican, Chinese. In his own words, he will explain to you why he does not deserve a holiday. That's the pop music history. And when I say pop music, you know how you hear, you know Taylor Swift's music, even though you don't seek it out? It's just forced upon you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, if you want to hear the good music, you do what, what I say is called digging in the crates. That's a hip hop term. You go dig in the crates. You search. You go down to the left of the dial. You listen to it. You know. You go to the clubs. You find out the obscure music. You need to find dig for the real history of this country. It's not going to be fed to you. The thing that's going to be fed to you is the stuff that 
is not right, <laughs> is, is, is myth. But the real stuff, if you dig, it's an ugly history, but it's a history for me when I find out what went on in like Stadville, one of the biggest plantations in Durham in the South. When I learned that the folks there were able to create the largest agricultural building in the South at that time, with no nails, with no plans, just created from the skills that they, they taught themselves, and there's a pride there that I didn't have before that like just makes you just makes you say, oh my god, like we are descended from this the most powerful the people that survived going from the middle passage, because a lot of people died that the people that made it there were the strongest, most resilient people, and we are descendants of that. And so once you put it that way. I think people understand, like, seriously, like, we, we, this was built by us, you know? And so for people to just diminish it, like, oh, slavery was a long time ago. This is a, I always get, get a shock when I say this, but when people say, oh, that was a long time ago, get over it, it was a long time ago. I say, I say, Jesus was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> no one getting over that. I think just people need to understand, like, it's, this stuff needs to be worded in a different way. Tom, you know, Thomas Jefferson, his, what, what did he call it, his um, mistress, said, yeah, yeah, it, it, this was not a mistress, this was a person that he owned, okay, that that wasn't considered a human being. And, and when people say that Barack Obama becoming president is a black accomplishment, to me, that's a white accomplishment. Because there have been plenty of black people that were capable of being president of the United States. This was the first time white people were able to bring themselves to vote for a black person. And so it's a white accomplishment. And, and I need people to understand that the success of black people in this country is a success for all Americans. And so it's in everyone's best interest. One of the things, we homeschool our kids and we live in a place where they tax a lot higher, the property taxes are a lot higher because of the school system. It's a, it's, it's a fancy schmancy school system. People always say, why do you live there? Like, why do you homeschool when you pay those taxes? Like, I wouldn't live there. This is like, why wouldn't I want my neighbors to be better educated? Why wouldn't I want my taxes to go to a better educational system? Like, I would rather them be smart and successful, and then they won't come and rob me, you know? It's just like, like, this idea that, like, I have mine, and I don't want, you know, everyone else needs to get, like, it's just so silly. It's so silly. There's, there's, a, there's a lack of, of, of concept of common good. Common good and empathy. Yes. And right. the, the empathy in a way that, like, someone, someone else's, that person outside who's homeless is our problem. It's not their problem. It's not a, oh, bring yourself up by your bootstraps type of thing. Because we didn't, black people didn't, don't, didn't have bootstraps in this country. You can't like bring yourself up by your bootstraps if you don't have it. Um, I talk about the sort of the wealth and, and how the wealth is built with, with the, all the low class mortgages that were given to this country. They weren't given to black people. So whites were able to build wealth by buying that first house like in the 30s up until the 60s. Black people didn't get that. Well, all the red lining. Red lining, yeah, yeah. That's how ghettos were formed. People need to know that. Once they know that, they realize, oh, okay, like, it's just, it's not, there's a system in place. And when people, you know, I used to build houses, okay? And yeah. so one of the houses that I bought, they gave me the covenants to, to the house from the early 1900s, and it said I was not allowed to sell that house to anybody of the Negroid or Semitic races. Yeah, they're unenforceable, 
but that was the God given. But yeah, I mean, they're unenforceable, but they are, they are forced. I mean, obviously, like when people say, oh, we don't have quotas, you know, police don't have quotas, they're on this, they're on that. It's all, and people say, well, what, what do you have to, why is you have to bring about race for everything? I didn't, I didn't make race about everything. White people made race about everything. And like literally every aspect of our lives is affected by that. From the restaurant you go in, if you look to the back, to the front, it gets darker as it goes back. Like if only works in the back, it's darker. If only works in the front, it's light. Like in every aspect, when, when a person goes to get a car, black people are charged an average of $700 more for any car, like, and, and getting a loan and all, like every aspect of everything. I, I could give you, you could say any innocuous thing, and I will tell you, I, I'm gonna spoil, I'm gonna spoil the Antiques Roadshow for you. <laughs> Antiques Roadshow, you watch that on PBS, you try to find somebody black uh, giving, coming up and going, Black people couldn't own a thing before 1960, and I'm just joking about that. But 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 literally, it is a celebration of like like white cultural plunder. Like it's people going, oh, um, we got this from the Sioux, uh, blah blah blah. You know, and it's just like, yeah, okay. Like how many people do you wipe out the wipe out for that? You know, just like it's total celebration of exploitation. And um, so, <laughs> all right, so why don't we stop and take some questions? Okay, no, no, no. You got me ranting. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> okay. We were here to listen to you. All right, okay. So, we didn't, we didn't even look at any comics, right? No, we didn't look at any comics. Okay. Did you like to look at yeah. comics yes. while we answer questions? Yeah. How long we do that? Really quick. All right. Okay. All right, so these are, you know, just how the thing is. Anybody like with questions, go ahead and raise their hands. So. So, this is one of my favorite ones, which isn't even a drawing. The All Lives Matter, Restrictions of Life, City Skin Color for Details. I, I, it works as a sticker. It doesn't work as a shirt. <laughs> I, I tried doing it as a shirt, and people don't look long enough to get it. So, uh, so do it as a sticker. Oh, did you do that happen? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you just keep that at home. But, you know, here's, here's the thing about uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, and I explained this in my slideshow. If I have a bumper sticker on the back of my car that says save the rainforest, it does not mean screw the other forests. <laughs> it means the rainforests are being cut down and we have to do something about them. So that's how I explain Black Lives Matter. So it's not like I'm being selfish. It's we understand that all lives matter. You know, other people's lives aren't getting shot down by police all the time. So, uh, Alex, question? Oh, yeah. Oh, hello, Mr. Knight. It's, I've loved your work for years, and it's so exciting to meet you. Uh, I'm just wondering what we should expect aesthetically from your new show, because I'm imagining like a Who Framed Roger Rabbit situation. <laughs> but, oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, can, I can go forward and see, because we have some pictures on here. So I can oh, see. some pictures of the show? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. you, you sent them and demanded it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so that, that's, um, that's me in, in a recreation of my San Francisco apartment, which is very exciting. We're shooting it up in Vancouver. And you're leaving right, in, right after this. Yeah, literally flying back to the set uh, right after this. And, um, and, and on the other side is, is our production office, and they made it all fancy with my, I'm going to steal those framed uh, cocktails. <laughs> Uh, when that all is said and done. And that's my Angela and Hill Scott Herod, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, uh, what to expect? Whereas, everything is, is something from the Cape Chronicles, right? So, there's the fan uh, on set, and there's some of the stars. Um, it's uh, Blake Anderson from Workaholics, uh, Lamar Morris from New Girl, uh, that's um, Rose McIver from I Zombie. Sashir Zamata from Saturday Night Live, and T Murph from T Murph. <laughs> this is his first show, so he's super excited. So, anyway, everything comes out from the Cape Chronicles. So, the Cape Chronicles, the nightlife is sort of the kitty version of the Cape Chronicles. So, it was in a mainstream newspaper, took out all the blue stuff, you know, 
the, the, the family's in it, it's very family friendly. This is the opposite of that. So it's gonna be the adult version of the K Chronicles. So it's younger, like it skews younger, 18 to 34 type stuff. Does that mean I can't watch it? You? <laughs> I will I would like to say I would test it. But it tested, it tested well with a very certain demographic that you may not fit in. <laughs> but, and also, like, it's very, we don't use a lot of animation. It's not like Roger, it's mostly live action. So we use the animation, and, and I can't really get into what the animation is, because that's part of the fun of it. But, um, but it, I guarantee you, you have not seen it before. And I guarantee that um, some of the parents will be like, you can't watch this. <laughs> Let's just say that. But it will be smart and funny. Okay, uh, next question. Go ahead. One question. Uh, how, do you protect, uh, how do you protect your um, your work from, uh, um, from getting copied? Like, how do you, uh, you I can't. I can't. Um, well, I mean, obviously, you can get your stuff. Um, there's a, a poor man's copyright, but you can send your stuff off for it to be copywritten and all this stuff. But here's the thing, if someone's ripping up your stuff in any public sort of way, they will be called out for it and they will be blackballed. Um, I've had people, um, you know, there was one person that uh, I know consciously ripped off my stuff and uh, and he, I've never heard from him again. And um, not that I had him taken out or anything, it's just that. I mean, just, <laughs> When it came down to him trying to create something, he couldn't, he just, he just never went beyond a certain uh, thing. Yeah, and, and then I remember uh, catching somebody else and calling him out on it, and he's like, oh, I didn't realize it, I might have seen it, but, but I don't know, it's just like, it usually gets around if someone's ripping somebody off and they usually get blackballed, but um, honestly, like, no one makes enough money in this business to be like, to, it's not even worth it, you know? It's not even worth it. It's not even worth it. Just create. Don't worry about anyone copying. If, if you're doing stuff that's good enough to copy, then you, you're going to be okay. You're going to be doing all right. So just keep on doing what you're doing. You know? And we have a question over here. Yes. You talked about your love of newspapers. Do you subscribe to the Raleigh or the Durham paper now? Uh, I absolutely do not. I just pick, um, I read them at the library. I support my local library. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I almost started to subscribe to the New York Times and then they dropped the, the cartoon from their international day. Right. For it just like a, a it was stupid. Yeah, it was a real stupid. silly reason. Yeah. And and so I, you know, one one controversy in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I try to support um, like writers and cartoonists. You know, people on Patreon. I have a list of creators that I support and, and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I would support. I want to support politicians that will get. I think there really needs to be a, a, a recreation. Look, we need to go back when you, you couldn't be a corporation and own multiple like media outlets. You couldn't own a TV station and a newspaper right. in the same market. Yeah, 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 because it really is destroying. There are so many businesses and jobs that are being lost because of that because of all this consolidation. That's one of the, I think, one of the, the reasons why we are where we're, we're at. And I, it, honestly, just the media itself, the fact that we're not calling people out on stuff is I, it's one of the biggest problems of what's going on today. If someone is blatantly lying, report that they're lying, just say, this person is lying right now. And these are the reasons why I think they're trying they're, they're trying to deceive the American people. Like, that should be it. It shouldn't be, uh, let's have this first, you know, it's like, uh, it's, you know, it's raining outside. Okay, we're gonna have someone who thinks it's raining outside, we're gonna have someone just to have someone go against them. 
who doesn't believe it's raining outside. Like, you shouldn't just have two people arguing about whether it's raining outside. You should open the window and say, it is raining outside. <laughs> we have just confirmed it. Sorry. One more question. Rant. Yes. I um, found your, your topic around uh, you know black folks' legacy in this country as you know kind of being the invisible people with invisible accomplishments when you really know the history is quite contrary you know to that. Oh yeah. As you look at um, you know kind of internalizing that and then trying to project how you deal with that issue in your in your work, how is that received, especially as you try to find, find mainstream outlets to better tell you know, that message? We, you, obviously, we don't want to appear as being ranting and being angry, but the message somehow needs to be told more broadly. I mean, we have a Holocaust Museum. Every, every you know, year, there's peace done on you know that history, but I I very rarely see you know yeah. oh, that's for our history. Well, I mean obviously we need to come to the America needs to come to terms with that and so and so when I mean America, white people need to come to terms with the fact that there's going to be some a lot of comfortable uncomfortable conversations. Like right now, the the discussion on say reparations or race in the country it only goes as far as when white people feel uncomfortable which is 5.2 seconds so that's as far as it goes and it needs to go farther than that but as far as the way it's been received for me i'm sitting here in the library of congress doing an interview <laughs> like i am traveling around the country doing slideshows i am I'm going to have a tv show on hulu i think it's being received really well and Maybe it's because the way I do it is through humor and through, like, you know, um, it has to go down with some medicine, like like a, a little bit of sugar goes down. But um, but I, I think I think people want to know this stuff. I just think it, it's, we were just talking about it earlier. There are really basic, simple things that need to change in this country. And one of the things is, when white people talk about, say, black, when they say black people, they tend to whisper it because they learn that black means bad all the time. So when you, well, seriously, most white people go, like, like, you know, like, and it's, first, like, just be able to say it, just say it. Black is okay, black is beautiful, black, just say it. Like, and it, it is, it's a, it's a positive thing, once you get, and, and don't feel like, like you're af afraid to engage people in these, in, the, in these conversations. Because the reason why you don't hear about this stuff, because people always say, oh, you know, I work with all these black folks. And well, they go, I work with all these black folks. And, uh, <laughs> and they don't say anything, they don't complain to me. It's like, why? Because they generally have, they are working for you and they are not in a position to say anything bad. Like, um, so like these conversations need to happen in a, I, I don't know if it's a in a more comfortable space. And, and we were talking about like a safe space for folks to talk about this stuff. It's really hard. Uh, this specialist, I read about this diversity specialist that goes into workplaces. And she says she goes into workplaces and even when they're supposed to talk about this stuff, people of color won't talk about it in their workplace. Because, and the people that feel the most comfortable are white people who are like, you know, I don't understand why kids are like they, because white people feel comfortable everywhere, everywhere. Like there's no place where you can't feel comfortable. And she says, at the end, people of color will come up to her and say, I'd like to talk, but once you're gone, I'm still in this workplace. And people are just like, like, so I heard you complaining at this thing. Like, all the power is this, this country is a white space. And it's, I don't even know how to explain that. Even when people come up to me and they go, 
I was on the bus, and it was like they won't get white person there. <laughs> I knew I felt like what it's like to be in Miami. No, you don't. Like, you have to grow up never reading about your accomplishments in this country. You have to turn on the TV and, and always see someone else as the protagonist, as the hero. You have to, like, have all this stuff carried on you before you ever even feel for a moment like you're a minority in this country. Because if you call 911 on that bus and the cops show up, you're gonna be the safest person then. So once people have that idea, that sort of grasp, then we can start to kind of move forward, you know? Um, and, and it's gonna take a long time, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I'll just say one minute, one last thing. Um, I did a talk in my hometown, Mall, Massachusetts, because the, the whole city was given the book The Hate You Give as, um, as a book to read in all the schools. And I was just happy because when I was growing up, I got more books where the protagonists were animals where the heroes were animals than people of color. Call of the Wild, you know, Animal Farm, Beowulf. I got nothing where there were people of color as heroes. So I was just happy that they're finally getting out of books like that where people of color are the, are the protagonists. And I got a, an email two weeks later from the commissioner of Mullins Schools. And he said, I never thought of that. I've never thought of it that way. And that's the thing, like, that's why you need to have diversity in your workplace, diversity on your board, diversity, because it's not, and it's not your, it's not white people's fault, it's just, it's completely out of there, but you gotta understand, like, your view is not the be all end all. And so, in order to make this country live up to its ideals, Diversity counts. When you say, I don't see color, mm -hmm. that is an insult because that means you're purposely forcing yourself not to see it because you think it's a, a detrimental thing. You should be embracing the idea of seeing color. You should be embracing the idea of, of seeing difference, differences in different perspectives. So. Embrace that, and, and I mean that for everybody and across the board, not just color or you know, race, but gender and age and, and through class, like class, like people who have a lot of money and don't have a lot of money. Like there are perspectives that we all need to, I'm just giving you a certain perspective, but we all have stories to tell. And so value those stories and, and immerse yourself in different stories. And on that, Keep night.